Okay, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us for this very special memorial lecture in honor of a, a good friend of the community. You know, I never knew him, but if you were at the funeral, you see how many people t were touched by this young man. Um, just speaking to a few of the guys from the crowd before the class over the past two weeks, I think everyone unanimously said certain things about Eric that could portray what a good young man should aspire to be. And the truth is everyone would talk about how he loved being around people. But it's not just that he loved being around people. People loved being around him as well. You know, there's a lot of guys that like being around people and no one wants to be around you. He was a type that you just want to be around him. He always smiled. You know, he knew how to put a smile in your face as well. But more than that, ladies and gentlemen, you know, from what I was told, he was a man that appreciated life, appreciated what he had. Because he had a tough time, you know, throughout his life, from his upbringings, etc. But whatever he did have, he tried appreciating. And one thing they were also telling me was about how he had a great respect for his Jewish identity, for the traditions, even though really he wasn't surrounded by such an atmosphere. And, you know, it was only a few days ago that there wasn't a picture, there wasn't actually a human being with us. Now that human being has turned into a picture. And, you know, some of you guys were sitting and talking with him and eating with him and chatting with him. What's going on? What's up? What are you up to these days? You know, one of the guys was telling me he was there on Hanukkah in his house, lighting the candles. I mean, you were there. He was a real person, just like you guys are all sitting with me right now. He was sitting with us only a few days ago. And, He's not here anymore. There is no physical body named Eric Stillman anymore. He's not with us. And, I want to stress, that we're not just here to commemorate Eric Stillman. That's not what we're just here for. You know, we're not just here to have some nice food, have a 30-40 minute lecture, and then move on with our lives. From what I was told, and what I just heard from the young man that just spoke, we're here to try to begin understanding our purpose in this world. But not only, re not only understand the purpose, but recognize the potential that we all have in reaching this purpose. You know, I always, I've been talking to youth since I was a teenager. I've been giving classes and lectures since I was a young man. And one thing I always tell people, it's not about building a program. It's about building individuals and making those individuals into couples and making those couples into parents that have a successful and responsible home, a healthy atmosphere. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the goal. You know, that is ultimately the goal of what this lecture here tonight is. To just sit down and talk about Eric, we could do for a week on end. The question is, how can we take this tragedy and maybe take a step closer to what our purpose is? And I'll tell you straight off, right off the bat, we're not going to answer all your questions. Um, um, you know, it's only one lecture, 30, 45 minutes maybe, right? We're going to have a lot of questions on life, but at least we could get started together with some of the basics. And anyone that has questions afterwards, feel free to ask. You know, you can stop me during the lecture if you like. If I feel it's on the topic, I'll answer. If not, I'll push you off later on. But Bezrat Hashem Naseh Nasliach, that's the goal. I think if you go in the street today, just do a basic poll, and just discuss with people on the street, you'll notice the majority of the world today, especially where we're living here in New York, they have no sense of direction in life. They have no goals, no aspirations. We may have a goal for the next 24 hours or the next week, you know, certain desires that we want to fulfill, but we don't necessarily have something down the road. Two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now. You know, many of us are living for the moment. And living for the moment is great, but living for the moment is not the ultimate goal. Now, I want you to understand, if you look at the divorce rates nowadays, could you imagine what the numbers are? Anyone can throw out a number? How much? 
60, 55, 70 in the Bukharian community, Shem Yerachem. 90, okay, that's already too much. But it's almost like when you go to a wedding and you give the $150 check, it's almost like, should I give it, should I not give it? You know what I'm saying? It's almost like, I don't know what to do. It's a waste of money many times. If it's really up to 70%, could you imagine? You go to 10 weddings a year, I'm sure. That means 7 out of 10 weddings went to waste. That's 700 bucks at least right there. You could have used it for better things. So the question is, where have we gone wrong? What has happened to our society? What happened to our people? What happened to this world? I mean, <laughs> what in the world could you imagine? You have the videographer. I've heard these cases many times. You're the videographer recording the wedding. You're sitting there working it out. By the time the wedding video is ready, it takes a year, right? These guys already want to get divorced. No, we don't need it. We're not paying you. You already have the debt. Have the debt. But these are real stories. And the question is, why is this happening? I mean, it's so sad. We prepare so much. We aspire so much. Especially the girl, since a young age, you're thinking about that wedding day. When you can just walk down, and you're taking pictures, and you're flying in the clouds. Right? All these... And next thing you know, you just come crashing down. Boom! Like, what hits you? He lied! He's a fake! He's a two-faced! Right? Had I really known... The question is, why? How did we get to this point? What exactly happened... Here in the year 2013, where so many crazy things are going on in marriage life. Now, the answer that I always give, I know some guys think, oh, this fanatic, fanatic, you know, fanatical rabbi, he's very primitive in what he says. But this is what I think, if you agree, please tell me. And if you don't, then uh, you can raise your hands and then speak up. I don't, I don't mind. But I personally feel that we have a totally wrong perspective as to well, who we're looking up to. I mean, fact of the matter is, fact, fact, fact. Most of today's youth, and when I say youth, I include every single person sitting in this room up until the age of 70, right? So in case someone's old, you should feel part of this. But the point is, most of today's youth, Litzarenu Arav, unfortunately, look up to Hollywood. They look up to the stars, as they say, to get direction on what love life is all about, romance is all about, and marriage life is all about. And let's be realistic, guys. Let's be realistic, ladies. If Hollywood were such experts on relationships, if they were the top, could you please explain to me why they cannot have a steady relationship? Why they all get divorced two, three, four, five times? Could someone explain? If these experts, these geniuses get divorced so many times, so how do we look up to them? It's like looking up to a friend that keeps failing in business and trying to become like him. Why would you want to do such a thing? Right? Does it make any sense that we still read about their lives and what they're doing and where they're going and what's this and what's that? And they were aspiring to be like them and live their lives when we were seeing it's an absolute failure? The number 90% that someone threw out is really in Hollywood. You know, we're still at 60%. So we're getting there. Why? Because we're still looking up to them. Why in the world is Hollywood not succeeding? And ladies and gentlemen, the answers for these questions are very, very basic. And Bezrat Hashem, I hope I could put this into your hearts. I'm not looking to change anyone's lives. Trust me. I work with couples in the community. I don't need any more headaches. I'm not looking to build a relationship with you. But I'm willing to help people out. And I'm just telling you the facts of life. And just comprehend the following, ladies and gentlemen. You see, I was visiting someone in the hospital a while back. Uh, she had minor surgery. And while I was there by the waiting area, they had stacks of magazines by the windowsill. Like they always have, you know, you're waiting there, what are you going to do? Right? Look at the ceiling, so you read a magazine. So, there are stacks of magazines, and interestingly, both stacks of magazines had the same exact Hollywood couple on the front cover. Same exact couple. Now, the first magazine, I don't remember the names of the couples, it's really irrelevant, but it showed Mamash, a guy and a girl, classic, beautiful smile, very dressed, very, very, you know, up to par, very prestigious look. And it says A and B in love. Now, anyone that sees this, you start thinking to yourself, that's all I want in life. You know, such romance, such love, such a good looking guy, good looking girl, money, fame, the whole nine yards. Why can't I have a relationship like this? Why do all the girls I go out with, bam, hits a wall, right? All the guys, bam, hits a wall. That's all I want. But my wife, Rabutai, ladies and gentlemen, if you look, 
<laughs> I saw a second magazine stacked up next to it. It was one or two editions later. I had the same exact couple on the front cover. Same couple. Same beautiful smile. Same beautiful prestigious look. But this time it was like a, a lightning bolt that was separating the two of them. And it says A and B split up. You mean B? How could it be? One month you're in love, one month you split up? How is that possible? Right? One month to the next, I mean, 20 years, 30 years later, but one month later, the talk of the town, the Hollywood talk of the town is already split up. And guys, ladies, you have to understand. <laughs> the reason for this is very, very, very simple. There's a famous line that they say in Hebrew. Anyone speaks Hebrew over here? None of the men? Oh, we have, we have a few ladies. Okay, the second row of the women's section speaks Hebrew, Baruch Hashem. So listen very carefully. <laughs> Interpret the following words for me. En lahem ahava, yesh lahem ta'ava. What does that mean? En lahem ahava, they have no love. Yesh lahem ta'ava, they have desires, they have lust. What that means is, he is a good looking guy, she's a good looking girl. He's a famous guy, she's a famous girl. He has money, she has money, right? He is a star, she's a star. Oh, she nechori, they get married in a few weeks, right? And everything's fine and dandy. Moreover, Rabotai, if you're going to base your marriage on stature, you base your marriage on, on status, you base your marriage on the guy's job or the girl's, it's not going to last. It's, it's a nice little story. Everyone can say, wow, they look so beautiful on Facebook. Look, oh, you're the most beautiful couple. Right? Such a beautiful couple. But I'm alive, Rabotai, in the house, it's an absolute war zone. Why is that? Because when you're basing your re relationship on status, on looks, on, on, on money, it's just not going to last. Because it's only a matter of time before the looks and the money doesn't, does, doesn't interest you anymore. You know, the piece of steak tastes good one day, two days, three days. You know, after a while, you can't handle the steak anymore. Right? You got to have a little more than just looks and external details. So... When you guys are talking about why, why our marriage life really isn't going too well, the answer is right there. And you've got to ask yourselves, if you're single, think about it. If you're married, then you can't really rewind. I can try to help you out if you need help. But the point is, the point is if you're single and you hear this, I think it's worth hearing it and putting it in your back pocket. Because this concept is plaguing our community. Where we're doing things just based on external matters, external things. So, the society is confused, everyone's confused, everyone's misguided. What's the solution, guys? What do we do? How do we get ourselves maybe more, a little more fulfilling in life? You know, if you think about it, statistics show that you've never had, in the, who knows how many years, so many people unhappy with life, depressed about their lives, and we've never had an economy or a world where you have such technological breakthroughs to make life so much easier, where you can communicate easier, and you could get to places easier, and still the world is not happy. Why is that? What's going on in here? I want you guys to understand the concept. You have to comprehend over here that all of you sitting over here, you were born with a certain mission, with a certain purpose. Now, anyone knows what the word Torah means? The Torah, what does Torah mean? Not Bible, not Bible. Right? What is the, what's the definition of Torah? Instructions. It comes from the word Hora'ah. The word Hora'ah means instructions, guidance. What this means is as follows. When I buy myself a new iPad, I buy myself a new car, a new microwave, whatever it is that you buy, you always have an instructional manual to tell you what to do, what not to do, how to do, when to do, make sure not too much sun, not water, not this, not that. You got to have an instructional manual to know how to use that item that you buy. Now, Torah means Torah means guidance. It's here to give you guidance as to how to live your life. It's here to give you direction as to how to live your life. The problem is that many times we think that we're smarter than the system. You know, it tells you, don't put the phone in the water and you go swimming with the phone. What's going to happen to the phone? It's going to be messed up. Right? So there's certain things in life that are basics. The basics you don't do. Basically, you don't get involved with. And unfortunately, me included, we make many mistakes because we are human beings. But the question is, how do we live our life on a higher caliber? A little better, a little more purpose. 
And that's something we're going to analyze Bezrat Hashem right now. I want you to listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. Anyone ever open up the book of Genesis, the first parsha in the Torah? Bereshit. Did you ever study it properly, in depth? You have a few heads. You know, a few guys that look through it, a few girls that look through it. In high school, I'm sure you did it because, you know, the teachers forced you, your parents sent you to school, you didn't want to want, but what exactly is the whole first book of Bereshit all about? The creation of the world. To understand the creation of the world is almost impossible. You know, we have, to this day, scientists and everyone discussing it. No, this happened, that happened, no, this theory, that theory. It's very difficult to understand. If you sit and study based on the Torah, you'll comprehend. But it's not a simple topic. I'll tell you this much. Listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. If you open up the Torah, you open up the Bible, you'll see over there, when God created the world, after every aspect of creation, after He created the sun and the moon and the stars, after He created animals and plants and trees, every aspect of creation, the Torah tells us, Vayar Elokim Kitov. God saw that this creation was good. The creation was good. However, when He created Adam and Eve, when He created me and Reuben Shimonov and Reuben Gadelov and Robert and all the ladies sitting over here, it doesn't say Vayar Elokim Kitov, God saw that you're good. It's not going to be. Every aspect of creation is stamped good. The dog is stamped good. You're not stamped good. The cockroach is called good and, and you're not good. How can this be? Does this make any sense? And, and if you think about it, we're the pinnacle of creation. And we're not even, you know, you know, at least give us a compliment, something. No, no compliments. No, nothing. The question is Why? Why would every aspect of creation be called good except human beings? And the answer is a foundation of life. It's something that you have to keep in mind because it will make you think a little bit. Harav Albo says as follows. He says, the definition of tov, the definition of good, is something that is complete, it's whole. What this means is as follows. An animal, sun, the moon, plants, food, the way they are created is the way they will always stay. They have no commandments to do mitzvot, averot, they have no sins, right? The way they are is the way they will always be. They are what they are. Therefore, God could stamp them tov. God could stamp them good. Why? Because they're complete. Human beings, on the other hand, Human beings, on the other hand, are told by God, you have to prove to me that you're tov, that you are good. What this means is a dog does not have to honor his father and mother. A cat doesn't have to eat kosher. It just goes to the dumpster. It doesn't look for the OU. Right? Because it is what it is. It has no commandments. It has no responsibilities. A human being was put in this world with a defined purpose. And you have a way to choose how you want to live your life. And there's no proclamation on how good or bad you are until your life over here expires after 120 years. That's what it comes down to. Therefore, when it comes to the creation of animals, of plant life, of the celestial, everything is called good. But human beings are left open. It's blank space. It's an open check. You got to prove yourself that you're worth something. Now you might ask, what do you mean? How do we do? What do we have to do? Is it a nice car, a nice house? How much money do you have to make? Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand one thing. The Torah tells us, You want to know what the definition of living a purpose in life? It means being involved with the Torah. doesn't mean you have to go all out. It means you put your effort to the base of your capabilities to fulfill whatever you can fulfill in the Torah. This way, if you do that, that's called Tov. You fulfilled your mission. If you did not put in your fullest capabilities, you did not fulfill your mission. That's what it comes down to. It's that simple. Now you might look at me right now, oh my goodness, why did I come over here? You know what? You know, I was hoping to hear some work. I want you to understand something. Some of you guys probably come to synagogue on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, some even come on Shabbat. Everyone on his own level. 
I tried it, Rabbi. It's not for me. I don't understand what's going on over here. You know, they put a box on my arms. I don't know what they want. They're wrapping it up. Right? Another box on my head. What do they want from me? You know, I just do this for the ritual of my bar mitzvah. You know, and uh, then, uh, you know, next time my relative has a bar mitzvah, I'll put it on again. But otherwise, leave me alone. And you know what? I don't blame you either. Because I want you guys to understand, you know, who, who over here, by the raise of hands, is a baseball fan? You mean? No guys? Only girls? Oh, one guy in the back. And now, it's very odd for a Bukharian guy, definitely for a Bukharian girl, to like baseball. <laughs> very, very odd. Um, you know, my parents were both born in the former... They were born in Bukhara. You know, I was born in Israel, and I've been here basically since I'm one years old. So I'm basically an American Jew. And there's a definitely a cultural gap between my parents and, and I, because they have more of a Bukharian mentality. I'm more Americanized Israeli. And when I got involved with baseball, and I would sit there watch the Yankees or something... My father would like try to like get into something else, you know, soccer, basketball. What's this baseball? You're sitting there. It's a three-hour program. Anyone that knows what it is, and it could be really boring. But you know what? My father they accepted what I am. I am who I am. Until I started asking him to take me to a baseball game. I was a nine-year-old kid, eight-year-old kid. Now you want to take a Bukharian man in his forties or fifties to a baseball game? It's like taking the average teenager to go apple picking. You know, let's go back. It's so exciting. Let's go pick some apples. You know, so. <laughs> I father, I get you a ticket for the Knicks, I get you a ticket for the Ra- I, This is not, what's this baseball? But he agreed. Oh, Hashem, he agreed. I was a kid, he took me out. And <laughs> we walk into the stadium. You know, he finds himself a nice place that's shady, you know, get really hot, and it was Sunday afternoon. He said, Elon, wake me up, you know, when the game's over. I'm thinking, wake you up when the game's over? We came here to enjoy the game together. What do you mean, wake me up when the game's over? All right, sit with me, let's drink some uh, Coke, right, and we'll cheer on together. And then he agreed. Every time I clapped, he clapped his hands. I would go boo, he would go boo. I would stand up, he would stand up. A few times he was cheering for the wrong team, but the idea is he was following, he was following the trends that I was doing. Can I ask you a question now? You think my father liked baseball after this experience? Obviously not. He just did it, just follow what the crowd is doing. Right? You know the big jumbo trons says, make noise, we're making noise, yeah, okay, hi. He had his experience, he wasn't interested in it again. In order for me to convince him, Mike, you can ask my father if you want, you know him, right? In order for me to convince him to enjoy the sport, I got to sit down and explain to him what a strike is, what a ball is, a single, a double, a home run, a this, a that. Otherwise, these rituals will mean absolutely nothing to him. He'll do it with me once or twice a year and leave me alone. I want you to understand, there's no difference between coming to a baseball game once a year or twice a year to coming to synagogue you know, Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah. How is it with you guys? Not all of you, some of you. You come in, everyone stands up, you stand up. Stand, you sit down, you sit down. Another guy stands to go to the bathroom, you almost fall into the bathroom. You know, you're just following the routine of the guy next to you. You know, bow down, okay, you're bowing down. Page 310, 310, you can't read anyways, okay, 310, 320, 330, right? You're just moving along with the crowd. Everything's beautiful, you're thinking to yourself, it's a once a year ritual, twice a year maybe. But I ain't getting involved with this. Why? Because it's like taking a Bukharian guy to a baseball game and expecting him to come back every single day. It's not going to happen. You got to understand the sport or the event that you're going to in order to appreciate it. How many guys follow football? All right? You watch any games today? Yeah, I do. Who won? I just I didn't get the updates. Yes. Oh, Hashem. So listen carefully. <laughs> Patriots won. That's good. But listen very carefully. I ask you something. Do you like football? The guy next to you, do you like football also? Maybe. Maybe? What do you mean maybe? You want to try it out? Oh, if you're betting. <laughs> right? But the point is, guys, the point is very simple. In order to enjoy the sport and appreciate the sport, you got to know the rules of the sport. If you don't know the rules of the sport, you're not going to watch. Maybe you'll have a good time to sit down with some friends and drink some beer once in a while for the Super Bowl to watch the commercials. But week one and week two and week three, you're not interested. Why? Because it's not for you. Now I want you to understand, when it comes to anything in life, the same rule applies. Nothing is different when it comes to religion as well. If you're going to come and be a robot, just clap because everyone's clapping and stand when standing and sit when they're sitting, what's going to happen is you're going to despise this event as well. Not only are you not going to like it, but you're going to despise it. Why? Think about it. Everyone in the stadium enjoys it and, they're, and you're just thinking they're just following them. So everyone in the synagogue seemingly understands. Truth is most of them don't. Right? But seemingly it seems like they understand. So you feel like you're an outsider. 
It's not for me. I'm not part of this crowd, right? And next thing you know, you make it into a yearly ritual, maybe a monthly ritual, right? And you're just losing the connection. So ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand. In life, if there is, if there is a will, there's a way. You guys know very well. If you want to get to something, you guys know very well how to get to it, right? You'll find your ways, you have your connections. That's how it is in everything in life. If there is a will, there is a way when it comes to spirituality as well. Now, again, I'm not telling you guys to become fanatics and get into no, basic, basic stuff. And I'll explain to you in a few minutes. But you have to understand, every single one of us that's sitting here right now has the potential and the capability to be on a higher level than what you are right now. Example, back to the people that speak Hebrew. How do you say person in Hebrew? Adam. What is another word in Hebrew that's similar to Adam? Adam is a short version of another word. Not, no, it's a shorter version, not a longer version. It's a shorter version. There's another word that has one extra letter. Adama. What does Adama mean? Adama means earth, ground. Now, we are all called earth. Think about it. Someone says you're a piece of dirt, say so are you, because we're all a piece of dirt. <laughs> That's what God calls us, He calls us dirt, He calls us earth, right? So the question is, why in the world would God call mankind earth, dirt? Couldn't we get a more respectful name? You know, Adam means earth. What kind of name is this? Oh, so you're going to answer because we're created from earth and after 120 we all go back to the earth. You know, that's an experience we don't want to think about, but it's a fact of life. So, everyone's going to go back there. You're going back to the earth. But come on, why everything has to be a scare tactic? That's like if they see each other, hey, but I don't, oh, you're scaring me, I'm going back to the earth. Is that what we're trying to do, scare people in life? Is that the goal, to call you Adam, to tell you, just keep in mind, you're going back six feet under? Is that what we're trying to do? Is, it, is this a positive way of living? <laughs> you think about it? Imagine, imagine this is what they wanted us to think about when they call us. Hey, Ben Adam, Bolapo, Mr. Come over here. You want us to think about death? Is that the goal? Does that make any sense? And the truth is, we don't even know what Adam really means. Earth signifies something entirely different. Anyone here has a backyard? I know it's not a cool thing to plant you know, flowers and, and fruits and vegetables. Anyone ever plant a seed before? What did you grow? What did you plant? A vegetable, a tomato, right? When you plant something, there's certain excitement over the plant, the, or the, whatever it is that you're planting. If it's a vegetable, you know, my mother-in-law, in her backyard, God bless her, she has all these types of vegetables. And when she serves me the vegetable, she has a taste, has a taste. It tastes like a vegetable, we don't even tell you. But she, she put her time into it, so she wants to know how it tastes, right? Okay. Hi, just don't show her the video. But the point is, the point is that when you put your time into it, you're excited. So she plants all these different types of vegetables and fruits. Now I want you to understand, in order to get that vegetable, the reason why she's so excited, because it's not a one day job. You're going to take, you're going to plow the land, you're going to plant the seed, you're going to make sure it gets the right amount of water, the right amount of sunlight. You got to basically nurture and baby this plant, this vegetable, this fruit, you know, carefully, you can't just leave it like that. You got to make sure everything is done accordingly. And not a week later or two weeks later. A few months later, maybe even a year or two later, you're going to start seeing the fruits of your labor. Moraiv Rabotai, we're not called Adam to tell you that you're a piece of dirt. You're called Adam to tell you that just like the earth, you're a bundle of potential. Just like the earth, Seems like it's nothing, but if you take care of it properly, you can get some special things coming out of it. Produce that goes all over the world. So to a human being, if you plow, that means you got to work hard. If you're going to plant, if you're going to water and get the right amount of sunlight, you'll see you could succeed in any aspirations you want in life. Whether it's to graduate college, to become a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant, or to become more spiritual. Anything that you aspire for, if you want, you will get there. You ask the average millionaire how you became a millionaire, you think, oh, I, you, know, you know, I worked so hard for 20 years and my uncle Dali got his money. No, 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 that's not, that's not the average story. The average story is the guy had a vision, 
He had a goal and he was going to pursue that vision till he gets there. That means if you guys want to get somewhere when it comes from a spiritual aspect, it's not going to happen overnight. This class and you're, you're starting to keep uh, kosher. No, no, it's not going to happen like that. These things are a process of plowing and planting and watering and make sure you have the right exposure. Who are you hanging out with? This is what it comes down to, ladies and gentlemen. You know, I forgot his name. Where is he? What were you saying? What's your name again? About appreciating life, pursuing what you want to pursue, right? You have to realize that life is too short to push things, push things off. You know, uh, uh, the common thing when it comes to religion, everyone always says, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when I finish high school, I'll start changing. The guy graduates high school. When I finish college, I'm going to start changing. He graduates college. When I get a job, I'll be a different person. He gets a job. I'm telling you, Rabbi, when I get married, me and my wife will be... He gets married. Oh, when I have a child, he has a child. When he's 13, you'll see me and him change together. He's 13. He gets by his wedding. Forget about it. He's wedding. Oh, when he has a child, I'm going to be a babushka. Then I'll start changing. Here, next thing you know, your grandfather. Next thing you know, you're 80 years old. You don't realize the time is just flying right by you. If I ask you with the raise of hands, Ruben, do you remember your bar mitzvah? How long ago was this? A while ago. But you remember the moment while you were there? Did you put on the talit and everything or no? You did that, right? I remember my bar mitzvah as if, literally, I could think back as if it was two days ago. I could think of my wedding as if it was two days ago. And Baruch Hashem, it's been a while for both. Um, um, but life is just running right by you. It's running right by you. You know, one day we're here, the next day we're there. One day we have this job, next day we have that job. One day we... Things are just going so fast and that we just don't even know what to do. So, when we're confused, the next thing you know... You're much older and you're like, what have I accomplished? Where have I gotten to? What, 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 where, where am I trying to reach? <laughs> you know, I, I tell this to people all the time. And it's worth repeating it over here as well. The, there's a mashal. How do you say mashal in English? A parable. I have two guys. Two guys that, that are working in the clothing industry. The clothing industry is a very good industry to get involved with. I'm not sure if it still is today. But there's a lot of money to be made over there. So there's two guys that got into that industry. And they were working for a high profile company. And the owner tells the two guys, listen guys, I'm sending you out to France for a clothing show. See the newest trends. See what's going on. You're going to offer our things over there. Right? I expect you guys to be there from 5 to 10 days. I'm not sure how long I'm going to need you back. 5 to 10 days. But every day that you are there, I expect at least a profit of $20,000 from transactions and, and contracts that you close. Every day that you're there. Okay, these two young guys, there's no problem. Give us a ticket, get the ticket. They get to France. The next thing you know, first day they just get blown away. They've never been to France before. The tourist attractions, the hotels, the nightlife, the great surroundings, right? So the first day they say, yo, you know what? We'll start working tomorrow. We'll start working tomorrow. Okay, it's so first day, gone. Comes along the second day, they didn't, they didn't even get started. <laughs> they, didn't, they, just, they didn't even get started. Eh? They continue on with another day. Comes along the third day, the, the other guy says, Yo, listen, man, you know, we have a lot of jobs to do. We have to catch up with $20,000 already. That's two days we missed. Right? Ah, don't worry. You think it'll call us back in five days? I'm sure it'll call us back in day number 10. Don't worry about it. Right? And next thing you know, the days goes by. Day number six, they get an email. You guys are back in New York in 24 hours. Why, 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 why? Now these guys are starting to get nervous. <laughs> they pack their bags, get back to New York, sitting before their boss. The guy is sitting there. So tell me, Joey, how was your trip? And Joey says, yeah, listen, man, you know, it was, it was pretty good. So Joey's a confident guy, so he's stuttering, right? But so it was pretty nice. So where'd you go? What'd you see? Oh, man, I'll be honest with you. I saw so many things I never heard of. I only saw it on YouTube. I actually saw it in my you know, in my... And he starts going on and on from all the tourist attractions, all the beautiful sights. And then the guy asked the question, so how much, how much money did you make? How were your transactions? Six days. What did you do? And Joey looks at the guy, can't even look, look him in the eyes. He looks up, says, Tishmai, listen, I, I, I got you know, $20,000, $20, you know, possibly, <laughs> possibly. $20,000 in six days? Yeah, it was very, very tough. Very tough. Okay, next guy, Bob. How was your trip? And Bob says, you know, I'll be honest with you, the first day I had a good time with him as well. It was amazing. We went here, we went there, second day. But then, you know, you know I, I didn't really have a chance to see that place and that place and that place. 
Because, you know, so how much money did you make? It's like, I made myself $150,000. Now, I ask you guys, not a simple, it's not rocket science, right? Of the two guys, Joey and Bob, who had more fun at this trip? <laughs> no question about it, Joey had the time of his life. But who fulfilled the purpose of the trip? Bob definitely fulfilled the purpose of the trip. He had both the fun aspect of it, quote unquote, and he was able to throw in his mission as well. You really don't want to be a bunch of Joeys. That's not our goal in life. You know, they're not going to be impressed after 120 years with, oh, I went here, I did that, I did this to this person, after that person, oh, you have to see my resume. They don't care about that resume. That resume means absolutely nothing. The question is, what were you able to do that is productive according to the guidelines and the directions given in the Torah? That's the question they're going to ask you. So if you want to come along and say you had a good time, no problem. But did you also add on to the aspect of life that you were here for? Did you sell any clothing? Did you make any dealings? Did you guys try to at least sell the clothes? Try to do a little more mitzvot? Try to change a little more? Not radically. We didn't tell you to go above and beyond. The basic traditions that we've had for over 3,000 years, the basic traditions that we've had that have become a foundation of the major religions of the world, that we even, you know, put our efforts into it, that we try to water the plants, that we try to give it a little nurturing, to get the right exposure. That's a question every single man and woman that's sitting over here has to ask himself, him and herself. You are all full of potential. Every single one of you, if you just think, where am I going to be in three years? Where do I want to be in five years? Where do you see yourself? Did you ever think that way? I was asking myself this question since I was 15 years old. Where do I want to be in three years? Where do I want to be in another three years? Why? I had certain goals that I set for myself, and I pursued those goals, both from an educational standpoint, from a religious standpoint, from a family standpoint as well. You know, do you see yourself in five years from now as a married person, happily married, with children? And if you do say yes, are you really preparing yourself for that stage? You think marriage is so simple? Where you just give me a cup of coffee? Yes, really, John, I'm here as a cup of coffee. Right? You think that's the way it is? Right? Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're, we're missing the foundations of life. We don't understand. We think everything is just kacha, kacha, kacha. We don't realize there's a lot of effort. Anyone here that put, opens up a business, you know, you got to put some time and effort to make this business succeed. You don't want the business to go down the drain after two years. You don't want your marriage life to go down after two years. But unfortunately, you guys told me the numbers, 60 to 65% of people are getting divorced. That means if we have X amount of people in this room, God forbid 60% of us will be going through a divorce. Could you imagine, Chaz Shalom? Is that, do we want to be part of that 60 percentile? Or do you want to be part of the 40 percentile? And the question that we must all ask ourselves is, is the life that we're currently living going to be helping us build a strong foundation for marriage life? Or is it going to make marriage life a little more difficult? You know, going out to certain places on a consistent basis means that you're addicted to that thing, whether it's club life, whether it's to here or to there. Are you sure you're going to be able to hold yourself back when you're married? Is it so simple? I asked a few of the guys this question. I mean, think about it. If you're doing it for so long, and now you're married, you have a baby at home, you have a two-year-old, and your wife's pregnant again. Pass me some more chips. <laughs> right? eating her chips while she's doing her homework. And she, that, that beautiful face has a double chin, right? And next thing you know, she may be not as attractive as it used to be. Now I ask these guys, are you going to have the inner strength to be a committed, responsible husband and father? To love her and only her? And the same question has to be asked the other way around. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you right now, I deal with many, many couples. With many people, most of the problems started not when they're married, when they were single. Why? Because we're all creatures of habit. You know, once I'm doing something consistently, I can't hold myself back. I'm not saying you're going to become, oh, no, you do things, certain things, you okay. But consistently, where this defines your life, Habibi, you're going to have a very, very hard time being married. And I feel bad for your children. That's what I feel bad for most. Because those kids will not have a normal home of a father and a mother caring for them. And that's a question we must all ask ourselves. 
This is the question. Where do I want to be in five years? You ever thought about it? Where do you want to be in five years? Where do you want to be in ten years? Think about yourself. You're not always going to be, you know, a young 25-year-old guy or girl. Life moves on. Next thing you know, you're 30, you're 40, you're 50. Where do you want to be at? These are questions you must ask. Be fair to yourselves. Give yourselves an opportunity. I want to share with you guys two more points before I let you go. Two very short points. Then you can ask questions randomly, whatever you want. Listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. <clears throat> this is actually a true story. You know, it blew me away. This story absolutely blew me away. Real story that happened here in this community. There was a certain lady that had, I think, six kids. All successful, you know, monetarily. They were making a lot of money. One doctor, one lawyer, one this, one that. Can't complain about their lifestyle. She got a little older. Each child lived in a different city. One in Connecticut, one in, in Queens, one in Brooklyn, one here, one there. And they put her in a nursing home. They couldn't handle her. It was too difficult. She was getting a little old. So what happens is they're moving on with their lives. And one day the oldest child gets a phone call. The phone call is from the nursing home. We're so sorry to notify you that your mother had a sudden heart attack and she's passed away. Now this hit him really, really hard. And obviously, you know, it's unexpected. They were under a tremendous level of pressure because one brother's in Connecticut, one is here, one is there. Jewish custom is to try to do the burial as soon as possible. So it happened late at night and the burial should be the next morning. So the nursing home told him, listen, if you like, we know you guys live in different parts of the Tri-State area. You guys all have families. We'll take care of all the burial preparations. You guys just come in in the morning, straight to the funeral home. You have the eulogies. And we go straight to the burial. The family obviously agreed. They obviously had to get everything together over the next 10 hours. Right? Overnight, next thing you know, the whole family gets together at such and such location, eulogizing their mother. Okay? It's the way of the world. What could you do? <coughs> Finish the eulogies, straight to the cemetery. They bury her. They say Kaddish. And now they're going to observe the seven days of Shiva, the seven days of mourning. Now what happens here is going to blow you away. The brothers are all sitting together, six brothers, or siblings, excuse me, not just brothers, six siblings, sitting together, everyone's coming in, your mother was so great, she raised me, you know, she helped me, and one time you needed this, she did this for me, and my mother, and this and that, all these beautiful stories about her, every single day, phone calls from different cities, your mother did this, and your mother did that, and on the third day of the Shiva, of the seven, they get a phone call, one of the children picks up the phone, and he starts getting a little nervous, and he passes out. Ah, what happened? Get him some water, water, blah, chuck, chuck. They give him water. Another child picks up the phone. Yeah, hello, we're sorry. And he starts getting nervous. And he starts... And the other brother takes the phone. Yo, who is this? They were thinking someone's cursing their mother. She was a witch. She was a this. She was a crook. Right? Who is this? And they hear on the other side of the line. Relax, relax. Why is everyone screaming? And he's quiet. And she says, why is no one coming to visit me? Is this a, a sick trick? Is someone playing games with them? What's going on over here? What exactly is going on over here? Mom, is this you? Yeah, sh you know, Shimon, why is no one visiting us? No, Mom, you don't, you don't understand. Now, he's, he's not sure, you know. No, you don't understand, Mom. You know, we were so busy. We had so many things to do. You ever come? You're coming right now, Mom. We're coming to visit you. Could you imagine about me now? happens to you? Like, what's going on over here? Who's, is this real? Is this fake? They all rush to the nursing home and they peek into her room and there she is reading a book. Their mother's reading a book. They go over to the attendants over there. What in the world's going on over here? Like, you imagine a big lawsuit coming over here as well, right? What in the world's going on? Our mother, and then next thing you know, the supervisors come, this, that, miscommunication. A different lady passed away. <laughs> now, that will also come from this side. Now, could you imagine the other side? Because <laughs> someone else buried the mother, right? So, Master Shaya, I'm not making up a story. That Dr. Seuss, I'm telling you a real story. So, what happens is, what happens is, <laughs> the whole staff there is panicking like crazy. They have to approach the family of this lady that did pass away. 
and they call up the lady that really passed away. The, the, the family lady that passed away. The son picks up the phone. You know, sir, we're sorry to inform you, but uh, unfortunately, your, your mother, you know, she passed away. The heck with my mother! Good! Take her, do whatever you want, cremate her, do whatever you want with her. They didn't even have a chance to tell him what happened. The whole mistake, and this guy starts cursing his mother out. They say, no problem, sir, we'll take care of it. You know, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to what happened over here. The brothers go, they visit their mother. She freaks out about the story. And all the old ladies over there, you know how they, you know, not just ladies, the ladies in general like to talk, especially the older ladies. How do you say, in, I don't know how to say in, 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 uh, in Bukhain, how do you say this? Huh? Gossipers are not Bukhain, not even gossipers. In any event, but they like to talk away, they like to talk. Everyone's talking about this story. Now listen to what really happened here. The other ladies in the, in the nursing home were telling over that this lady that passed away, her son came in a few months earlier and he told her, I want you to know that when you die, I will make sure you don't get the proper burial. I will not say Kaddish for you. Right? And he starts cursing around and he walked out. That's what he told his mother. Only child. That's the only child. So the other ladies in the nursing home all saw this happen. They're telling over to the children of the lady that's really alive, that the dog was dead, that this lady cried every single day for the past three months, saying to Helim, begging God that she gets a normal Jewish burial and someone says Kaddish for her. So God made a whole story over here. We never know how God, God runs the world. Where He made it that there's a little miscommunication. She had six guys burying her. And six guys said Kaddish for her, and they continued saying it for her the whole year. Why? Because she prayed that she would have a normal burial with Kaddish. And the story doesn't end there. The children told each other during the Shiva, during those seven days of mourning, Mom would have loved to see us sitting together the way we are right now. You know, someone died, everyone's together. We wish she could have seen this and been here with us to see us together. And they had the opportunity, because their mother was alive, and she got to see it. Ladies and gentlemen, based on what I was told about Eric, again, I don't even know him personally, but he loved being around people. He loved being around, people loved being around him. He always smiled, people smiled, he just wanted to have a good time, eat, drink. I guarantee you he wishes he could be here with us sitting, listening to this lecture. I guarantee you about this. He wishes he could be here. But there was no mistake. We know he passed away. But I want you to understand one thing. This is a concept that's a fundamental idea in Judaism. I want you to understand this concept. When a person dies, we don't necessarily say he died. What do we usually say? Passed away. Passed away. Watch this. You see this? I have a cup of Sprite over here. Right? If I take this Sprite and I pour it into this cup, what happened now? Did the, did the, did the Sprite die? No, it just went from one cup to another cup. It's still around. You have to understand. I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to ask the question, where is uh, Gamlet's out here? I'm going to ask Ruben instead, because you organize the shield. First of all, I want you to give a round of applause to Ruben for, for organizing the shield. If you know how much time you put into it, because that's the Ruben, I'm going to put you to the test right now. Okay? Maybe stand up so everyone can see you. I'm going to ask you a simple question. <laughs> what? Ruben, listen, stand on the chair. No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 it's okay. Ruben, I'm going to ask you a simple question. You see me right now, right? You see me right now? You see my hands? How many fingers do you see here? Four. Huh? No, five. Uh. <laughs> right? You see four fingers, five fingers? How did you see me right now? What are you seeing me with? Uh, why are you cheating? Why are you helping him, guys? How do you see me? You see me with your eyes, right? That's what you just... Huh? I want you guys to understand this concept I'm about to tell you. Ruben, you do not see me with your eyes. You see me through your eyes. I'll explain to you what I mean right now. Imagine this room is pitch dark. Choshech. Dark. Totally dark. Right? And now you walk over to the wall. There's a little hole over here. And you can see what's going on in the next room. How do you see the people in the next room? With the hole or through the hole? You see through the hole. The hole can't see. You have to understand. Every single person is comprised of a physical entity and a spiritual entity. We have a body that's physical. We have a soul that's spiritual. Your soul is inside your body, it's totally dark and has two holes to see through. Now imagine this 
hole in the wall, has a glass over here, and it's a bit scratched up. Now, I ask you another simple question. When I look through, I don't see well. Is it a palm with me? Is it a palm with a, with a glass? I would say with a glass. I see perfectly fine. The soul, I have glasses. The physical entity for my soul to see through is damaged. Obviously, if you study the science of it, the brain obviously sends messages, whatever it may be, it's damaged. Nothing is damaged with my soul. My soul is perfectly fine. The physical entity is damaged. Now, if I walk over to this wall and I bang it down, the, ball, the wall comes down, now I can see everything. Nothing is impeding me with my vision. I don't need no little glass to see through. When a person dies, the soul comes out, now you can see everything. It's not limited by a physical body anymore. All I want to tell you is, life doesn't end when you bury the person. There's a whole new life that's beginning, and it's a spiritual life. And we won't understand it in this lecture, because you know what? <laughs> it's not a one-hour discussion. But what I want to tell you guys is, that Eric is alive and well. If you have any other relatives that died, they're alive and well. Because at the end of the day, there's a spiritual aspect to life. Rest in peace. We rest in peace. Right? What you're saying is, may his soul rest in peace. You have to understand, there's much more to life than what the eyes see. There's much more to everything. You know how much germs are in this room right now? You know? There's millions and millions of particles of germs and, and, and who knows what flying around. But you don't necessarily see it. You know what? 50 years ago, no one even knew this existed. No one knew germs existed. Why do you think people used to die for surgery? They would just wash the knife and do it to the next guy. They didn't, they didn't sterilize it. They didn't do anything to take care of the, of the metal. The more and more that we move on in life, the more we see new advancements, new knowledge. The Chavet Chaim used to say, and we'll end off with this. He said, he died in 1939. Anyone ever heard him, Chavet Chaim? Yeah. He was a great, great Posek and a great Jewish mind. He said as follows. He told his community that the closer and closer we get to the times of Mashiach, you'll see more and more technological breakthroughs to see the power of God. Let me explain to you what he's referring to. In this time, all they had, they ever saw those big uh, recorders to listen to music? No one ever watched, uh, what was that called? Happy Days? What's that called on TV? Where the guy had the huge uh, jukebox, is that what it's called? Right? But, but that's all they had back then. He said, the closer and closer you get, you'll see more. Now, I'll tell you why he said that. You go back 100 years ago and tell your, your great-grandparents that everything you do is seen by God. It's heard by God. You say, come on, I'm sitting here in Queens. I have relatives in Brooklyn. I have people in Australia. I have someone in Austria. I have another guy in Israel. You're telling me he sees everything that, that goes on in the world. Is it really possible? He hears everything. You're telling me it's possible to hear everything. Give me a break. The closer and closer we get, today I sit in my office. I have 15 screens. I watch what you do in Boston, what he does in LA, what you're doing in New York. I, with our limited power of the... We don't use all our brain power. How much do we use? What? 5%, 7 Ruben maybe, 10, 15%, right? But the point is, we don't really use too much of our brain power. We can't. But guys, if we're able to create these kind of systems, technological breakthroughs, to see everything, to hear everything, you have a little thing, you have a little recorder in your pencil, and you have a little thing to... to, to and you guys could question if God could see what goes on in the world, the one that created this, this mind of ours. We have to realize the purpose of life is to enjoy, to have a good time, but to also know, sell some of the clothing. <laughs> you know, make sure, don't just go in France and just have a good time. Don't just come over here. Because the boss might call you up at any time. Guys, you're coming back home in 24 hours. But over here, we don't get a phone call. It could be just so sudden, Chaz Shalom. Right? Therefore, I believe and I'm confident that you guys will take something. I think one of you guys told me that everyone started saying Shema Yisrael, if I'm not mistaken. Who told me that? Everyone started saying Shema Yisrael every single day. Right? Whatever it is that you could do. I can give you guys my phone number, you can call me up for any questions. You want to have more guidance, more advice, I want to add this, I want to add that. But take upon yourself something that will give you more purpose in this world. Where you'll see there's more than just the physical aspect. There's something we have to do in the spiritual aspect. And Bezal Hashem, if we take this upon ourselves, I believe how hardly we'll all get a stamp of Tov. You fulfilled your mission in this world. Bezal Hashem, we should be zochet to continue growing spiritually. You should all have success in your physical matters, in your financing, in your education. And Bezal Hashem, have success. When you go to the baseball game, you should know what's going on. Right? Try to be interested to know what's going on. 
ask around, what are we doing? What's happening over here? I'm not running away. I'm here. Everyone knows I'm here almost every day of the week. If you want, Ruben will give you my number. If you have any questions, you want to ask questions right now. Be'ezrat Hashem, we should all be zochet to see Be'ezrat Hashem, 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 be